Welcome, everybody. Aloha. Glad that you've tuned in this morning. We love being able to just still uh, continue on sharing the Word of God uh, through video and through live streaming and Facebook and YouTube. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Today, we're going to be looking into uh, John. So open your Bibles to John chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 19 through 31. And some of you are probably saying, wait a minute, didn't Pastor Jason just teach on that on Wednesday? And that's so funny because Jason and I were talking together and we were studying for completely different messages all week. And then all of a sudden we both felt around the same time that God changed the direction and brought us to these passages. And so when I heard Jason's message on Wednesday, I was like, that's exactly what the Lord put on my heart. And he's like, well, bro, you should probably just teach it anyway because there's so much in there. And that's the beauty of the Word of God. It's alive and it's living and and there's so many applications and it takes us so much deeper than we thought before. You could read a passage over and over and think you got it covered and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit takes you deeper. It's kind of like we could take five pastors and we could give them all the same verses to look at and, and they could all read those verses and preach a, a different messages completely because they'll touch on the verses that they have. They'll all agree on those certain points, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, each pastor will take us in five different directions to show us things that will apply to our lives, that, that we can be encouraged and grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when Jason taught on Wednesday from these passages, his focus was Thomas the skeptic, the wounded soldier. And he developed this whole thing on the peace of God and the importance of us having the peace of God, that peace that passes all understanding. So what I'm going to look at today is I'm going to be focusing on uh, don't miss church and to walk by faith and not by sight. 
you know, church is so important, and there's a, there's a beauty, there's a blessing uh, when, the, when the church gathers together corporately and worships and prays and, and just something about them all being together and the Holy Spirit moving. I mean, it is such a blessing, and it's, it's important for us to gather together and worship and, and not to forsake the gathering of the brethren. It's, it's so important for us to gather and give praises to God because something dynamic happens when we all get together. Now, you're probably saying, well, wait a minute. Um, um, I know we can't meet right now, so we're kind of missing out on that. And I get that. I mean, thank God that we have YouTube and Facebook and we can stream and there's podcasting and we can continue on getting the word out. And, and, but what I, I think I want to say to you is, though, even though you're at home, let's treat it like we were here. So what would you do if you were coming to church on Sunday morning? Well, you'd get yourself up, you'd get ready, you get the family ready, the kids, and, and then you'd come to church, you bring your Bible, and you turn off your cell phones, and you would be just sitting, and you'd be worshiping and praising, and just, just hearing the music, and all the voices singing, it would be an amazing thing, and then you'd be attentive to listening to the Word of God. So now that you're at home, did you get dressed up this morning? Maybe you didn't get dressed up. Maybe you're still in your pajamas right now. Maybe you're lying in bed watching this right now and listening to it on the TV. Um, I don't know. But here's what happens when we're at home. So many distractions come in. You know, you might be at the breakfast table eating breakfast, and then there's those distractions. Ma, I need more sausage. Ma, I need more bacon. Is there any more eggs? Or maybe you're sitting on the couch right now listening to this, and you're texting people on the phone. Got you. My encouragement to you right now is you can stay in your pajamas. I don't care. But if you're eating, eat your meal, finish, sit down in front of the TV, open your Bible, and turn your phone off and be attentive. So important. So as we look into these scriptures, let's just dive right in. Let's look at verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. The same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to open up the word. We, we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would take us deeper in such a familiar passage, deeper than we've ever been before. Bless this time. Open our eyes to see. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive everything that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the picture. We, we see uh, the disciples are all gathered up. They're locked down in a room. And, and when I was looking at this, this was crazy. You know, we, we see that um, they're, 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 they're fearful. Uh, they, they've been gathered together praying. And, and as I looked at this scene, it really hit me that this is kind of like where we're at right now. We kind of can relate to where they're at. Their whole lives are in turmoil at this point. It says they were fearing for the Jews, capital J. That means they were fearing that the nation, the religious leaders were coming after them. Why were they doing that? Well, historic writings tell us that the, the Jews thought the disciples attempted to burn down the temple. 
And then they were afraid of the government because the rumors were spreading that uh, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that the disciples came in and stole his body. And so they, their lives were all just in turmoil. They were freaking out. They had doubt. They had fear. Uh, they were worried about the government getting involved. They, their whole world was turned upside down. Their health was in danger. Their livelihood was in danger. They were unsure of their future. They were thinking to themselves, would life ever be normal again? And people were blaming Christians for all the things that had been happening in the last couple of days. And, and I, you know what? I looked at that and I thought to myself, is that where we're at right now? I mean, can we not relate to that? I mean, here we are. We are in lockdown just like them. And, and our lives, in a sense, can be in turmoil. And so many people are living with doubt and fear when we shouldn't be fearing. We should keep our eyes on Jesus. But that fear comes in. We're human beings. And, and there's this whole conspiracy theory that the government is uh, doing something behind the scenes to come after us and to take us. And, and the world has been turned upside down. And our health is endangered by the virus. Our, our livelihood is in danger. The economy, we don't know what's going to happen. We're unsure about the future. And how many times have we said, would, would things ever be normal again? And you know what's crazy is that now some of them are blaming Christians for this whole virus. And I just thought, this is nuts. And so as we look at the, the disciples gathered into this room and locked, we see that, peace, that Jesus comes in and says unto them twice, peace unto you. Now, now why did he say that? Why did he say that? Well, Luke gives us a, a better view of what was going on there. In Luke 24, verse 36, it said, And as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and he said unto them, Peace unto you. But they were terrified, they were affrighted, and they supposed that they had seen his spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled, and why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is I, this is me, it's myself, handle me. And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And so they're freaking out, they think that they saw a ghost. I mean, he pops in there, he just comes, the doors are locked, everything's shut up, and he just comes right through. Nothing can keep Jesus from coming into our lives. That's what's so awesome. And, and so he calms him down. He says, listen, it's me. He says, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. And it's interesting that he said flesh and bones because you need to understand, that's so important to understand, because the, the Bible says that, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and bone can. See, Jesus was flesh and bone. He was in his glorified body. He was now spirit-driven. He wasn't driven by blood anymore because all of his blood was poured out on the cross. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and bone can. And this is great for us because we are going to have a body fashioned like his. We are going to be in our glorified body and that we're going to be able to go in and out of places just like what he's doing. And the neat thing is, is that when we get to heaven, we're going to have flesh and bone. We're going to have our new body. We're going to be spirit driven and not blood driven, not carbon driven, but spirit driven. And that means that we're going to be able to hold one another another. And I say that to encourage you because so many of us have had loved ones go to be with the Lord, family or friends, and, and that there's going to be a reunion one day. There's going to be a reunion that when you give your last breath on this earth or Jesus takes us out with the rapture, that we're going to see our loved ones again. And when you run to them to embrace them, it's not like you're going to run right through each other like a spirit. There's either going to be something you can tangible that you can hug, that you can kiss, that you can just embrace. And, and so we will have these new earth Earth, these new earthly bodies will be transformed into this new heavenly body and, and we will be spirit driven and no more driven by blood. We'll have those new bodies in heaven. And then one of the neat things that Jesus says as he calms him down, he says, listen, does a spirit have uh, flesh and bone? He says, it's me. Handle me. And then he looks at him. He says something really cool. He says, you got anything to eat? And they give him some broiled fish, and they give him some honeycomb, and he eats it. And I just got to think to myself, okay, he's in this new glorified body. It's like, where did that go? Where did that fish and that honeycomb go? I mean, he, I mean, he pops in. He's able to come right through the walls and come in there. But then he eats this fish, and then I'm thinking, well, if he goes out, does the fish and the honeycomb hit the wall and drop to the floor? But no. 
That's what's so incredible about these new glorified bodies. His glorified body, when he asked for something to eat, he ate it. You know what that tells me? That we're going to be able to eat in heaven. Praise the Lord. I I don't know about you, but I love to eat. And what's the best part about eating? It's tasting, it's smelling, it's chewing, it's swallowing. But the worst part about eating is the weight that we gain. And so when we get to heaven, here's the awesome thing, is that we're going to be eat, but we're going to have these new spirit drive bodies, and you're not going to gain any weight. Just enjoying the taste without the calories. Isn't that awesome? We're going to be able to eat, and we're not going to gain weight. We're going to be in this new body that's incredible. And I don't know, if that excites me. I don't know if that excites you. I mean, it tells us in, in Revelation that when we get to heaven, all things will become new. And I know that we're going to be eating in heaven. And so I'm thinking to myself, can you imagine being there 10,000 years? And you're there 10,000 years, and you've been eating every day with everybody and enjoying this food. And, and then one day you decide, you know what, I'm going to take the, the, a break from dinner tonight, and I'm just going to uh, hang out with Moses and talk to him and, and pick his brain. You know, hey, Moses, what's going on? What was that all about? That you did? Tell me about that. And as we're talking, we miss the meal, and all of a sudden somebody comes by, and, and you say, how was dinner? And they're like, it was awesome. It was new. We've never had it before. Can you imagine being there 10,000 years and having Something brand new every day. All things are new when we get there. I like the idea that we won't be gaining any weight because uh, I love to eat and just to be able to taste the food and experience it and not add on calories. I know because some of us are, con- are just you know controlled by working out. We're consumed with the workout and we're trying so hard to get ourselves in shape and we won't have to worry about that back then. Maybe, you, maybe you're desiring that washboard stomach. I mean, I got a washboard stomach. It's just got a little laundry on top. But when we get there, we won't have to worry about it. So when Jesus appears to them in this room, they freak out thinking that they've seen a spirit and he says unto them peace unto you and in verse 20 of John 20 he says that when he had said that he showed unto them his hands and his side then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord why were they glad well Luke tells us in his gospel that he opened their eyes they opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and so he basically opened their hearts up to understand the scriptures because he'd been telling them these things all along you know so many times we say oh you know I already know that verse you know what we need to hear it again Because how many times has Jesus ministered to us and told us something? We say, oh, I'll never forget that. And then we forget. And then somebody reads that verse. We go, oh, yeah, I I remember that. I was never going to forget that verse. And so he opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures that he had been teaching them all along. He had been telling them over and over. He was going to be delivered up to the Jews. He was going to be killed. But, hey, I'm coming back. And he told them that over and over. And it was just like when he said it, it just kind of flew over their heads. They're like, oh, yeah, well, well, whatever. That's great. But who's going to sit on your right hand and who's going to sit? on your left and so we need to be reminded the scriptures over and over and he opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and then in verse 21 check this out then Jesus said again peace unto you as my father has sent me even so send I you and when he had said this he breathed on them and saith unto them receive you the Holy Ghost Wow, they're born again right here. They're saved. They're sealed by the Spirit of God. They now have Jesus dwelling in them. You know, and some people say, oh, no, that's not when they got saved. They got saved at Pentecost. No, Pentecost was when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, received the promise, the power and the promise of the Father. Right here in John chapter 20, Jesus breathes on them. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit. They were born again. But he talks about he's going to send them out. And he knows that he can't send them out without the power and the promise of the Father. That was the purpose of Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to receive the gifts and the power from the the Father to do all things in Jesus' name. Jesus had been hanging out with the disciples some 40 days after the resurrection. People were receiving the Lord, no doubt. And here they are sealed. They are born again. Now he says there, he says there, as my Father had sent me, so I send you. The Father had sent Jesus into this world with full authority, but now he says, now I send you. And the idea is that he was sent with full authority, but we are sent 
under his authority. Under his authority to do what? What verse 23 is saying when it talks about whosoever sins are remitted, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. What verse 23 is saying is that we have the authority given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ to tell people if you ask Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you're forgiven. And we also have the authority to say, but if you choose not to ask for forgiveness, you're going to hell. That seems kind of harsh. That's, that's a little bit offensive. I, I, you're telling me that if I don't repent of my sins and ask Jesus into my heart, I'm going to hell? Yeah, I am. Well, that's offensive. I get that. You know, we look through, all through Paul's scripture and we see him trying to minister to people. And he said, I became all things to all men that I might win some. And what he was talking about was the gray areas. He was looking into the culture. He would do whatever he, it would take outside of not sinning. He would not sin, but he would do whatever it would take to reach people with the gospel. He, if he was with the Jews, he would eat kosher because he didn't want to offend them. If he was with the Gentiles, he would eat a ham sandwich or bacon and eggs. He, did, he was all things to all men that he might win some. But there was one place where he wouldn't budge. There was one place where he didn't care about offending people, and that was the cross. And that was telling them that there's only one way, that Jesus is the way, and that if you repent of your sins and you ask Jesus into your heart, you're going to be born again. But if you reject what Jesus is offering and you fail to repent, you're going to go to hell. The cross is an offense. And you know what? I would rather offend you and see you in heaven than to be your best friend and watch you go to hell. You say, well, you know, what about all those other religions? What about them? I mean, you know, you got all these good people and they're doing great things. I understand that. But listen, you don't get to heaven by being good. You don't get kept out of heaven by being bad. It's not a bad matter about being good or bad. It's a, it's a matter of receiving Jesus Christ and acknowledging that he is Lord, he is God, he is the creator, and asking him into your life. He paid the price on the cross. All you need to do is take the gift of salvation and live forever. I don't care how bad you were in your past, Jesus will forgive you. I don't care how good you are, you're still a sinner and you're, and, and you're falling short of the glory of God. We all need to repent and ask Jesus into our, our hearts. Of all these other religions, you've got to understand something. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with the true and living God. Everything else is religion. Religion is man's attempt to right himself with God, and we cannot do it. You see all these other religions, and if you look at them closely, they're all working. They're all thinking that by my efforts, somehow my good will outweigh my bad, and that maybe I'll reach this plateau or reach nirvana or this level, and no, it doesn't work. See, because God will not have you say that you had part in your eternal life. You cannot add to anything that he did. It's not works. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace. And so when you look at all these other religions, they're trying to earn their way to heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven. There's no way. And even you got these churches that say they're Christians, and they're adding to what Jesus did. They said, oh, well, you're saved by faith and this. Uh, you're saved by faith and nothing else. Oh, well, you're saved by faith and water baptism. No, you're not. You're saved by faith in being a member of our church. No. You're saved by faith in, in having our books. You're saved by faith in keeping the law. You can't keep the law. It's saved by faith and nothing else. It's the only way you can be saved. You can't add anything to it. There's a lot of good people out there, but they need Jesus Christ. You say, listen, you know, um, when you talk about other religions, it's, it's an offense, but you got to share that Jesus is the only way, that people need to acknowledge the creator. You know, Buddha said this. He said, I knew a way, and Krishna said, I saw a way, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except by me. You say, well, that sounds pretty narrow. Yeah, it is. The way to eternal life is a narrow gate, but broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and many go that way. The, the, the way to salvation is narrow. And you shouldn't be marveling that there's only one way. You should be marveling that there is a way. And Jesus made a way. And it's narrow. And you need to accept Jesus Christ. And that's what people have such a hard time doing because they want choices. Well, I don't want to do it your way. Well, there's only one way. And that doesn't change anything. You have to do it Jesus' way. Listen, if I had a cure for cancer... 
Would you be arguing with me about it? Would, would you say, well, pff, what, you only got one cure? You only have one vaccine for, for cancer? I want choices. I mean, I've been, I've been drinking wheatgrass and eating spirulina and bee pollen, and my doctor says if I change my diet to this, that, you know, <laughs> this will work out for me. Really? You wouldn't say that at all. If I had a vaccine for cancer, one vaccine cured every single cancer, people would be lining up by the multitudes to receive that vaccine because they understand that they have cancer and that cancer is going to kill them and the only way they can be saved is by this vaccine. All of us are in sin before we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We were born in trespasses and sin. We were all dying from the cancer of sin. But Jesus is the vaccination Repent of your sins and receive Jesus, and you'll be saved. You will be born again, and you will have eternal life. In verse 24, he says this, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them and Jesus came when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands in the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Now this is interesting. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came the first time. And now the disciples come and they tell him, oh, we've seen the Lord. And he is upset. He says, listen, I, 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 I don't believe it. I don't believe it. i got to see it for myself. And unless I can put my finger in, in his hands and my, thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And you might say to yourself, this guy is stubborn. These are the guys he's been hanging out with. And, and he won't accept the fact that they said they saw Jesus, they handled Jesus, Jesus breathed on him. I mean, you would think, come on, dude, these are your friends. You can trust these guys. And it's funny because I was talking with my wife about this scripture, and, and Anna said she was saying, well, you know, I, I just feel like he was, he was hurt, that he somehow felt left out, you know. And, and you know what? That's a good observation because I think she's right. I think that he was hurt. I think that it was the idea that, like, wow, you mean Jesus came to you guys and he didn't wait for me to get there? And, and why didn't Jesus come to me? And how come, well, I mean, how come he, he came to you and how come he breathed on you? I mean, what am I? Am I chopped liver? I mean, I was doing ministry with him for three years and I was there with you guys. I mean, I was around all the time and, and how come I missed out? And maybe that's what he was feeling. But the point is he wasn't there. And my point is this, we never know what we're going to miss when we miss church. Thomas missed Sunday evening service, and he missed Jesus. Now, I hear people say to me all the time when I tell them, you know, you need to go to church. There's an importance of that. And, and I have them say to me, well, I don't have to go to church to be saved. And I go, well, you're right. You don't have to. I mean, church doesn't save you. You're saved by faith and faith alone. And, and then people will say, well, you know, Jesus is always with me. And I say, yeah, I get that. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But here's something you need to understand. Notice that Jesus didn't go to Thomas's house. He went where the believers were gathered. There's something very special about when the believers get together corporately and they worship and they pray and they read the word. The Holy Spirit is moving. There's a dynamic there that you can't get sitting by yourself. Oh, yeah, Jesus is always with you. But there is something that happens when we get together and we worship the Lord Jesus. Notice that Jesus didn't go to Thomas's house. He went to where the believers were hanging out. You need to come and hang out in church. It's so important. And I know it's hard to get to church sometimes. You don't feel so good. Everything didn't go right that day. But I'll tell you what, I can't tell you how many times that I have been bummed out and burned out and made myself go to church, forced myself to get there, and then once I was... There, I just I left just feeling lit up. I just left with joy. I felt encouraged, and I was so glad that I had come. Here they were gathered, and, and Jesus showed up, but Thomas wasn't there. He missed out, and what did they do? They rubbed it in. They said, Thomas, you know, you missed it. Jesus was here. We handled him. We got to see him. We ate with him. You know, he breathed on us. We received the Spirit of God. We are now have Christ dwelling in us, and all the disciples were, were just, you know, rubbing it in, in a sense. 
And Thomas wasn't going to miss next week because look at verse 26. In verse 26 it says, And after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. There it is. He wasn't going to miss out on that. You know, when we see people who have missed church, you know what we need to do? We need to rub it in a little bit. Oh, girl, you missed it. Oh, worship was off the hook. I was crying like a baby. And the message, oh, you missed the message. It was so encouraging. I just left with so much joy and gladness in my heart. Oh, you should have been there. Rub it in. Why? Because it works. Oh, Thomas, you should have been here. Jesus was here. We received the Spirit. Oh, we ate with him. We held him. It was beautiful. Now where do we see Thomas? We see him in church. You know, Hebrews 10, 24 says this. this. It says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Let me read that. Let me paraphrase that. Let us consider one another to rub it in unto love and good works. To provoke unto one another love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. Jesus is coming. We need to get ourselves ready. Verse 26 says, then after eight days again, the disciples were within and, and, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus and the doors being shut and he stood in the midst of them and, and must have freaked them out again because he says, peace unto you again. I mean, it's a little frightening when somebody just pops out of nowhere, right? Then he says to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. I love that. I love that. Jesus comes in right through the walls and he's standing in their midst and Thomas is there. What a scene this must have been. He says, peace unto you. They all calm down. They all look at him. And then Jesus looks at Tom, Thomas. I mean, what a scene that must have been. He looks over and, he's, and, and he stares at Thomas and, and all the disciples must have just went, oh. he's looking at you. And then they're looking back at Jesus. What's he going to say? And Jesus is like looking at Thomas, and he's like, Tom, Tommy boy, here you've been talking about me. Look, here's my hands. Put your fingers in the nail prints. Thrust your hand into my side. You know what's amazing about that? Is that is exactly what Thomas said to the other disciples when they were telling him that he missed out. You know what he was doing? Jesus was teaching them a valuable lesson that even though you don't see me, I'm with you. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He says, I am with you always. And even though we don't see him, he's with us. And when he said the exact same thing that Thomas had said to the disciples, they realized at that point, he, we didn't see him here, but he heard everything. How many times do we miss out because of a lack of faith? How many times do we lose our peace because of a lack of faith? Thomas was lacking faith. He, he had to see in order to believe. He, he, was, he felt like he missed out. He didn't have a peace because of a lack of faith. And so many times, that's why it's so important for us to strengthen our faith. Because we don't receive the blessings of Jesus without having the faith to walk out on the water, to get out of the boat and step onto the water. You think about the children in Israel. They did not go into the promised land that Jesus had for them because of a lack of faith. He brought them right to the border. He said, go on in. They're like, no, there's giants in the land. They're going to they're gonna destroy our children. They're going to eat our children. Oh, we can't do that. And because they failed to go in, he said, you know what? Because of your unbelief, because of your lack of faith you are not going to go into the promised land you will perish in the wilderness but your children that you were afraid for they're going in we need to walk by faith and not by sight especially right now we got to stop looking on the horizontal we just got to stop looking at the government and, and our economy and everything that's going on around us and just settle down and look up and keep our eyes on Jesus it says, the just shall live by faith. We are saved by faith. 1 Timothy 6.12 tells us that we are called to fight the good fight of faith. Listen, without faith, we cannot please God. Now, you might be saying right now to yourself, I have a lack of faith. I have no peace. How can I get more faith? I'm glad you asked. Romans 10.7 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So how do you get more faith? Read your Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Well, I, I don't understand the Bible when I read it. I don't care. Just read it. A lot of times I read the Bible, I don't understand. I mean, when you're reading Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, you're like, what is going on there? You just read it. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to you in the perfect timing. I can't tell you how many times I read something in the Old Testament and I didn't get it. And then months later, I'm reading in the New Testament and all, the whole, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit brings to light. That's what that's all about that I read in the Old Testament. So you just keep reading, even if you don't understand it, because the word is alive and living. And God will reveal his word to you in the perfect timing just for you. But you got to read your Bible. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In verse 27, when he says uh, to Thomas, you know, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. you got to understand something right there, that, that God wasn't rebuking him. For not being at church, he rebuked him for not having faith. For not having faith. We need faith. We need to have faith. And the only way you're going to get that is by reading your Bible. And so when he said that to Thomas, check this out, verse 28. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, my God. What a powerful Powerful statement. My Lord, my God. You know why that's so powerful? Is because, check this out, nowhere in all four Gospels did any man proclaim Jesus as God. Only here. Thomas was the only one in all of the Gospels that made this statement, my Lord, my God. And I got to believe he probably didn't even reach in and touch his hands like the, the disciples did the week before. I, I just think he probably just said, you know, I'm good, and fell on his face and said, my Lord, my God. What a statement. He'd been, he'd been stewing in this all week, wondering why, why didn't Jesus reveal himself to me? How come I wasn't there? Why didn't he wait for me? Doesn't he care about me? And all these things. And he said, boy, in hearing of this resurrection, how could he raise himself from the dead unless it was God? How could he just come right through walls unless he was God? How could he breathe the Holy Spirit into somebody unless he was God? And as he stands there and he says, Thomas, touch my hands. Thrust your hand into my side. Thomas is going, none of this could come about unless you were not only my Lord, but you have to be my God and he says my Lord my God and I bet the other disciples looked and go oh, we knew that we knew he was God yeah that's it but Thomas was the only one to make that statement that Jesus was not only his savior but God the creator of all things in verse 29 Jesus says unto him Thomas because you have seen me thou hast believed blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Wow, Thomas, you saw me, and because you saw me, you believe, but there's a blessing to those who haven't seen Jesus and believe. That's for you and me. There's a blessing that you and I have that the apostles and the disciples in Jesus' time will never have. We will have this blessing throughout eternity. They'll have, they'll have other blessings, but this is a blessing that only you and I enjoy because we believe without seeing. In John's first uh, epistle, John, 1 John, he says, Many had seen, many have heard, many have looked upon, and have handled of the word of life. And you look at that and you go, well, that's not us. I mean, we didn't get to see him like the apostles did. We didn't, we didn't get to hear him speak like all the other people did. We didn't get to look upon him as he was on the cross or as he came out of the tomb. We didn't get any of that. But you know where we fit in is that last part, that handled of the word of life. That's us. See, Jesus Christ is the word. He is the word, and this is the word of God. And every time we pick this up, we are handling the word of life. Jesus says, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus do in the, in, in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe and G that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Do you believe today? 
Do you realize that the road is narrow to Jesus, that there's only one way? Are you dying from the cancer of sin and you haven't asked for forgiveness? Why don't you ask for forgiveness right now in your heart to repent of your sins and ask Jesus into your heart and receive the gift of salvation right now? Just pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe you did what you did for me, and I, I, I trust in you. Save me now. And if you did that, you become a child of God. Now I encourage you, walk by faith and not by sight, and don't miss church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, you're an awesome God. We put our trust in you, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you and not to look at our storm, but to look at you. Lord, thank you for always hearing our prayers that we can come to you at any time. Thank you for your blessings of your word. We give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.